Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. In the next seven weeks, there is no way to combat the fourth principality in our assignment and do it nice. Um, my hope and prayer is that at some point in the next two series, either myself or Pastor Woody are going, we're going to say something that will offend you greatly. Um, and the reason is, is if we don't, we cannot rattle you or shake you out of apathy. Uh, we've been in this course where we've been combating principalities. Uh, we've dealt with isolation. We've dealt with poverty. We've dealt with hopelessness. And our fourth is apathy. And I just don't know of any way to be nice about it. So I've tried to be as tactful as I can be, but this is going to get nasty. All right? Uh, because... Most of us don't even know we're apathetic. And so we've got to do something to rattle that. And so let me just start by saying this, that the word apathy, the literal definition of apathy means without feeling or little or no concern. And that, that should probably awaken us a little bit, but I think maybe perhaps that the, the, the more impactful or the one that perhaps carries the most Revealing and what should probably frighten us a little bit is the Greek definition of apathy. When you look up the word apathy in Greek, it literally means without passion. Without passion. How devastating and what a shame and what a sham if those of us that have called ourselves passion are so consumed by apathy that we don't even have what we call ourselves. It's like going to Sonic and expecting the food to be fast. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> the name of this body was not chosen because it was cool. It wasn't chosen, chosen because I'm a pyromaniac and I like fire. Although I do like fire and although I have a tendency to sit around on paper and doodle flames. That, that really has nothing to do with, with why we chose the name Passion. Almost nine years ago, we selected the name Passion because with one word, one word, it, it wraps up and calls us to uphold a standard that we would become people that are consumed with passion. It is the standard. And if we don't live up to that standard, then we are literally guilty of false advertising and we need to take down our sign and burn all of our T-shirts and rip all the stickers off of our car because if we are consumed by apathy rather than passion, we are not living up to what we've been called to live up to. And let me just tell you something. If you've chosen to stick around, because there's some that couldn't handle that standard. If you've chosen to stick around and call this your church and this is your body and this is your family, then you too have accepted as a challenge on your own life that you have to live up to the standard by which we go by, which is we are people of passion. That's who we are. Our level of concern, our level of praise must be at another level or we need to change our name. We are called this. So we've marched through these principalities. And what I want to declare to you today is that I, um, I believe that apathy is the principality that is going to be the toughest to uproot. I also think it may be one of the more important ones because here's what I've learned. If, if we battle isolation to the point that you now are connected, maybe you just used to come to church every once in a while, surface level relationships, and you've made an intentional effort to become more connected, maybe through the... The, uh, the attack on poverty, you've surrendered your finances to the Lord and now what you discover is that you have more than you used to because you're in obedience. 
uh, maybe uh, the, 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 the attempt that we made to break the spirit of hopelessness and to tell you why you should have hope. If we've done all of that, but we don't confront apathy, can I tell you what happens? This is literally what happens. We have relationships and we have resources and we have what everybody else is looking for. And if we don't defeat apathy, we will sit on the sidelines. We will become bored. We will be consumed with uh, being un, uninvolved. We will be unmoved and we will be un, unconcerned. We will have a form of godliness with no power to back it up. And so we must uproot this. Over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to start this four weeks in a row. Um, we are going to confront our apathy towards people. And then, after four weeks of dealing with our apathy towards people, we will then begin to combat our apathy towards God. And you may say, well, that seems like that's kind of backwards to me. I think we ought to deal with, the God, with God first. All I know is this, is if you can't love the ones you can see, how can you love the one you can't see? And so we're going to deal with it in that order. And we're going to ask that the Holy Spirit talk to us. Because here's the truth. I need you to understand this this morning. If you're not careful, this is what we do. We become so consumed by apathy that we will literally sit in a service like this. And we will think, what he's talking about is not for me. It's for my neighbor. For my neighbor. And that is apathy. So I'm asking that the Holy Spirit interrupt the, the slumber and the sleep and the apathy of our life. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I'm asking you to do what I cannot do. What we are talking about in this, this, this time together is something that I cannot uproot in the natural. This takes a supernatural surgery on our lives. I'm asking you to turn the spotlight on each and every one of us. I pray that every person in this room, every person watching over the internet will feel like I'm talking specifically to them as if I crafted this message just for them. And Father, I pray that when they feel that way, they would understand that it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. And that they would allow your glaring light to reveal areas of apathy. And we'll give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oklahoma is ranked among the highest in the nation for women killed in domestic disputes. 593 Oklahomans, mostly women, were killed by their intimate partners between 1998 and 2013. Half of the counties in Oklahoma lack a shelter for victims of domestic violence. Half. It's because we don't care. A quarter of all, 25% of all children in Oklahoma are at risk of going to bed hungry tonight. When we get out of church and go to the nice restaurant that we will go to, 25% of the children that you see as you drive down the road will go home hungry tonight. Nearly 700,000 adults are unsure about where their next meal one co will come from. One in 16 Oklahoman seniors are also at risk of going to bed hungry tonight. But you ain't got nothing to eat in your kitchen because we're so picky. Okay, never mind. I'm, I told you I was going to be nasty. I, over 10,000 children, 10,000 children are in DH custody, DHS custody due to neglect abuse, or they are simply unwanted. In 2014, 14,182 children were confirmed by DHS as victims of mistreatment. And I see the glare. I see the glare. We just wonder what we're going to eat for lunch today. Oklahoma has become the pipeline for sex trafficking of children in the United States. That's here. That happens here. Oklahoma ranks first in the nation in child abuse. We rank first in the nation of children going to bed hungry. We rank second in the nation in homeless youth. We rank second in teen pregnancy. We rank third in divorce. We rank fourth in women murdered by a husband or their lover. These conditions combine to make the children of Oklahoma some of the most vulnerable in the entire nation. And did you know that right now the average age of a sex trafficking victim in America is 12. 
12. In 2014, there were 4,916 babies, and they want us to use the word aborted so that we'll cover up and become apathetic towards the fact that they were murdered. Murdered in our state. In 2014, there were 626,906 Oklahomans that live below the poverty level. And the the poverty level is $23,000 or less in a year for a family of four. And there were over 600,000 that lived there. 209,022 children were living in poverty in 2014. 284,000 children in families where there were no parents that had a full-time, year-round job. The Oklahoma City public school system had... 3,187 homeless children enrolled in the 2014-2015 academic year. Think about that. Oklahoma had 46,643 homeless children in 2012 through 2013. Overholzer Elementary, because I know it's just numbers out there. Overholzer Elementary that we can throw a rock at and hit. I, I reached out to the principal because I remembered she told me this, and I was like, I, surely I don't remember the numbers right. So I, I hit her up again and said, tell me again, how many of the children, over 600 children attending that school right there, how many of them are living below the poverty level? 87 to 90%. But they're in Bethany. That doesn't happen in Bethany. All right. 317,000 children in 2014 lived in a single parent home. Here's the problem. Those are statistics. And this is what we do. They're just numbers on a page. They don't mean anything to us. We have become numb to the plight of those around us. We have been programmed to simply turn the channel. We, we've been trained to turn our attention to, 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 to things that are pleasant. We consume our time so that we don't have to really think about what's happening so that we can ignore. And then apathy continues to reign supreme. This, we even bring it into the church. What we want to do at church is, please, pastor, entertain us for one hour. Just one hour. We just want to be here one hour. And so we can just keep on keeping on. And at the most what we will do is probably at some point in that hour, we will stop and ask God to protect us from any of that happening to us. So we want to be protected, but we don't want to be prompted. And we don't want to be picked to do something about it. Because we don't care. We are apprehended by apathy. There's a passage of Scripture that I want to draw your attention to uh, that I think applies. It's a little bit different. It's found in Luke chapter 19. It begins in verse 41. It says this. When the city came into view, talking about Jesus, he's on his journey back to Jerusalem. When the city came into view, he wept over it. And this is why. He says, if you'd only recognize this day and everything that was good for you, but now it's too late. In the days ahead, your enemies are going to bring up their heavy heavy artillery and surround you, pressing in from every side. They'll smash you and your babies on the pavement. Not one stone will be left intact. All this because you didn't recognize and welcome God's personal visit. Jesus, in essence approaches his hometown. I know he wasn't born in Jerusalem, but Jerusalem was the center. It was the epicenter of his ministry. It's where he spent most of his time in that that vicinity of that area. And he's approaching his hometown. And it says that when the city came into view, he wept. Just a simple challenge and maybe a question this morning, and then I'll get out of your way so maybe we can go back to the comforts. Of life. My first challenge to you is simply this our hometown must come into view. His hometown came into view. I believe that our issue is that we have become so apathetic that we no longer see people properly. We no longer see 
our hometown properly. We no longer see as we sung. We sing it, we just don't apply it. God help me see like you see. And instead, what we do is, is we, 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 uh, we fail to allow the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts so that we can see our city, our hometown, through the eyes and the perspective that Jesus had. When you view our hometown, Oklahoma City Metro, well, I don't live in Oklahoma City, I live in Yukon. It's all the same. Come on, Piedmont, War Acres, Nichols Hills, more. It's all the same stinking thing. It all runs together. You don't even know when you left. When you view your hometown, do you simply see the glitz and the renaissance? It's not like it used to be, man. When I was a, I was a, a senior in high school, I was listening to 91 FM. Some of y'all, some of y'all know. Um, it wasn't the junk they play now. It was good stuff, like White Cross and Striper and <clears throat> never mind. Uh, I, I diverge. Uh, uh, and I won this concert ticket. Kathy Tricoli, I think. Whoo, that's a blast from the past. Some of y'all don't even know. Y'all don't even know. So I, 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 let them, I lived in Anadarko. I borrowed my dad's, I don't know, 1980 Lincoln Continental four-door, six mile long, six, mile, six, six miles to the gallon of gas. And I start my way from Anadarko all by myself, even though I won two tickets because I couldn't find nobody that wanted to come listen to that. And so I come all the way, and the, 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 uh, the, the concert is downtown Oklahoma City. The dilemma was... They failed to inform me that they had canceled the concert. And I end up in downtown Oklahoma City after dark, all by my small town, lily white self, scared out of my gourd. Because they were all one way streets and I couldn't figure it out. And I was as lost as I, no cell phone, can with a piece of string attached to Anadarko, was about the best we had. It, can I tell you things have changed? And what we, if we're not careful, is we examine the renaissance and fail to realize that all that we have done is push the things that we don't like to look at further out so that we can ignore. We, we never allow the pain and the problems of our city, our hometown, to come into view. See, I know it's easier to, to, to uh, cocoon yourself in comfort. And I recognize that it is easier to become, just allow yourself to be distracted by daily interests and daily distractions and daily duties. It's easier to do that. I get that. I understand that it's tempting to become so preoccupied with your own pain that what you in fact do is you allow all the compassion and all the passion to become all but stamped into extinction in your life because you're so consumed with you. I'm asking you to see our city again. D -d -don't, don't allow the media campaigns that tell you it's all great to become what you believe. I'm asking you to wake up and like, much like Jesus, I want you to allow the city to come back into view. And I want you to understand that when he sees the city, he begins to weep because he recognizes what they've gone through and, and what they're about to go through. Which leads to the question. When Jesus saw was what was happening and going to happen, he wept over his hometown. Here's my question. Have you wept? When is the last time you heard somebody say something about what was going on in our hometown and it moves you to tears? I just read to you, I, I hit Nico up because he's, a, he's in, uh, in the circles that can find out some of this stuff. And, and I just read to you some stuff that shocks him. I read stuff to you that should shock you. Instead, we're doodling on our bulletin, thinking, well, he's got 15 more minutes, and then he's got to let us out because there's another crowd coming in. When is the last time that Jesus got a hold of your heart, and when you saw the plight, 
that people are in, it caused you to weep where moms decide to kill their babies, where babies are going to bed hungry, where you spend more on your car than they make all year long, but you got nice clothes. Okay. Jesus was so moved by compassion and so moved by passion that, that he, the reason he was is because he knew that he was the answer to their problems. Didn't he? He knew that. He recognized that, that, that he was their answer. He was crushed that, that they needed him and they wouldn't accept him. That crushed him. Another way to say it is like this. Rescue was within reach, and it crushed him. Relief was literally cresting the hill. Salvation was within their grasp, and it was destroying him to know that they were missing that answer. Maybe, just maybe, we have forgotten that we have the answer to the problems of our hometown. Maybe we've forgotten that, 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 that we have the resources. One man said this, and I believe he was right. He said, the local church is the hope of the world. We get nervous when people talk like that because we want to change it and go, well, Jesus is the hope of the world. So that it doesn't put the attention on us. But Jesus said that we are his hands and we are his feet. What good is there to have a head if you don't have a body? Okay, I'm preaching right now. I I need you to understand that if we will uh, embrace our name and if we will once again embrace our call and mobilize to distribute the hope that we've battled for, then we are the hope of our hometown. Maybe we've come to the conclusion that this is really just about having good church services and being spiritual on Sunday. That's what this is really all about. As long as we have some good services, ma'am, get the lights right, get the smoke right, get the temperature right, uh, then maybe we can have good church. Maybe we've forgotten that Jesus has commissioned us to be the instrument by which all of the things that he has are distributed to those in need. Here's what we do. We huddle together weekend after weekend and the answer's within their reach. But they know where we are. I mean, we've got a cool sign. They know where we are. I wore my t-shirt to work this week. Surely they know. What good does it do if we are hopeful? If we are people that are hopeful if we are also self-centered and self-consumed. Can I tell you? I can tell you what good it is. Can I tell you? Since you won't believe me, can I just tell you from Scripture? Okay, Galatians chapter 6. You're not going to like this. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 9. Do not be misled. No one makes a fool of God. Listen to this. What a person plants... He will harvest. We like that one. Whatever a man sows, he'll reap. When somebody treats us bad, we like that one. But we don't read the rest of it. What a person plants, he will harvest. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. All he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvest the crop of real life, eternal life. Listen, so let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit. Right now, listen to what he says. Right now, therefore, every time, unless I'm going to the lake, Unless I got a ball game to go to. Unless I needed, mama needed some new bling. 
I knew, okay, I said I couldn't be nice. Every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all. And then he gives us kindergarten, starting with the people close to us in the community of faith. Signifying that there must also be a graduation point where we don't use everything we've got up on us. Okay, Paul makes it very clear that God pays attention to more than just how we respond to God. It's not enough to come in here and worship the paint off the walls and sling, swing from what we used to have, which was chandeliers, or run the seat backs. That's not enough. He, he says, he literally makes this contrast. If you ignore people, you ignore God. You can't even claim to be passionate about God if you're not passionate about people. Okay, He says our love for God should become seed that we plant into others, starting with those in the body, but then graduating beyond the body. In fact, we're informed by James that anyone who sets himself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. The kind of religion, that kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. Listen to what he says. Real religion. The kind that passes muster before God the Father is this. Reach out to the homeless and to the loveless in their plight. That is real religion. In other words, what he's saying is real worship isn't a good song that moves us or a good word that challenges us. It is when we take the answers and the resources that we receive week after week after week after week after week and some of you for year after year after year after year and some of you for decades after decades after decades and you take what you've got and you find those that are devastated by life, who are broken who have no hope. And you look at them. And like the disciples, you may even have to say, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give unto you. Here's life. Here's hope. That is real church. That is real worship. Notice Jesus, when he approaches his hometown, Pastor Woody's going to hammer this later. But I want you to notice that Jesus did more than just weep. His tears drive him to action. I want to say this morning, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I want you to cry, baby. I want you to cry. I want you to fight apathy and I want to challenge you to the point that you find that you must once again grasp and grapple with what is going on around us so that your heart is captured by compassion. I want you to weep again because some of us need to be broken hearted again. Some of us are willing to go across seas and send money across seas, but we won't cross our yard to help people in need. We need to be broken again. We need to have compassion again. Some of us need the smile wiped off of our face because we're walking through life as if everything is okay for everybody and around us people are dying. And we just smile. Blessed. How you doing? Blessed. Great for you. I'm asking you to allow the Holy Spirit to crush you by the confused, bound destroyed, sin-controlled state of our state. Some of us need to cry. We need to weep over our hometown. Some of you need to weep over the hopelessness of your homies. Some of you need to cry about your classmates because they're crazy. Some of you need to sob over the systems that made all these promises that didn't work, and you need to sob to the point that you decide, you know what, they weren't supposed to take our place anyway. The only reason they're trying to take our place is because we're out of place. But we're having good worship services. So I want you to weep. But I need you to hear me this morning. I don't want you to just come to some altar and cry. I want you to understand that that is how Pentecostals placate their apathy. They spiritualize it around altars. I've been around Pentecostal people all my life. You know what we do? We weep and then we wimp out. That's what we do. We speak in tongues. 
but we won't serve. We blabber around, we, we'll blabber and blubber around altars all day long, but then we bail because we'll call for volunteers. Never mind, okay. Our emotion, what we allow to happen is we allow our emotions to exonerate us from having to do anything. I had emotions at church, it was a good day. Yeah, and while you're being emotional around an altar, people don't have enough clothes to wear, they don't have enough food to eat, they want to kill their babies because they don't know what to do with them. Babies and children are locked in systems that where they need people to foster and care, and we won't do it because we don't want them inserting that into our family line. But we cried around an altar. I just need to tell you this this morning that over the next four weeks we're going to ask you to get involved. You will say, why? Why don't we just spend some time in prayer? We're not even going to have an altar call today. I refuse. I refuse to let you off the hook that easy. No way. You're not having an altar, altar time on my time this morning. Nope. You can cry home. Because if I let you off the hook, that's what you'll do. And depending on how far the snot hangs off your nose, that will be the gauge by which you determine whether we had a good service or not. I told you I've been around Pentecostals all my life. That's what we do. Apathy is dissolved by action. Apathy isn't something that you think away. Apathy isn't something that you can talk away. I even want to say this to you, and I'm going to mess some of your theology up. You can't even proclaim apathy away, because I can stand up here all day and say, we will be people of passion. We will shake the world. We will help people. And we just go on back to our business and say, well, he made some good proclamations. Apathy, the only way to uproot apathy is this, action. That's the only way. You've got to become so shaken in your complacency that you go, me, Lord, send me. I'll do anything. I, I don't like it. I, it's, not, it's, not my, it's not my cup of tea. It's out of my comfort zone. I might have to talk to people that don't look like me. I may have to go to a side of town that I've never been in past like 3 o'clock because they scare me to death. I might have to take some time. Apathy can only be uprooted by action. As you practice caring, you peel away and you unseat apathy. And can I tell you right now, I can see it. I can sense it. This principality will not go easy. He will not go quiet. Even right now, some of you are resisting me because you're going, I already do enough. Like in 1952, I helped so-and-so. That was enough. In 19... 1999, they made a call, and I made one pledge, one time, and whoo, that's enough. Even no start of babies over there somewhere in Ethiopia, that's enough. And we let ourselves off the hook. Action. So here's our altar call. Some of y'all might want to go on vacation for the next three weeks. I don't know. Here's our altar call. In the four, next four, today and the next three Sundays, we are going to give you very practical ways to unseat apathy in your life. It's going to cost you. You might not be able to go to Starbucks six times this week. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to, as you exit the building this morning, our ushers and our greeters are going to have uh, boxes that look like this. On them is a list of dry food items. This box, when filled with these items, we believe will feed a family of four for three days. You say, well, Steve, I don't have the money to do that. Clean out your pantry. Of this. If you don't, if, if, if you're financially struggling, I get it. 
I'm asking you, this will take guts and this will be hard, but shake off apathy. I'm asking you to partner with somebody else in our congregation. If you're single, if you're a college student, if, if you're struggling financially, we recognize that this is a challenge for some of you, but that's not an excuse not to take action. Partner with somebody. Go out of your way and say, listen, I can't do this by myself, but could you help me do this? And over the course of this week, we're asking you to do it in one week. If you can't do it in one week, take two. But, by, but before, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday, we need you to bring these boxes back full of these items. That's just step one. Next Sunday, I'm just giving you precursors so you can plan. Next Sunday, and I, I get it. It sounds like we're just piling on. Next Sunday, we're asking you to bring $20 per family. And we make this promise to you. We're not asking you to give it to us. You will leave service next Sunday with your $20 in your pocket. We promise. Believe me? Some of you know. You can believe me. Next Sunday, you will leave with your $20. So this week, fill the box, or over the course of the next two weeks, next week, bring $20. And then we'll tell you about what's going to happen on the third week that I think is going to position us in our community to live up to our name. Father, this morning I pray that you would shake us to our core. I pray, I pray that we would refuse to be trapped by apathy and that we would take the practical steps necessary to confront this principality and drive him out of our life and out of our body. I pray that this week you would give us opportunities beyond just the box. I pray that you would give us opportunities to distribute hope and grace and love. And in the moments that we feel like we need to spiritualize it so that we don't have to do anything about it, I pray that you would give us a very practical, lifelike opportunity. Somebody that we come in contact with would suddenly show up. And we would be reminded that Jesus, you wept, but you also took action. We come against apathy by our actions this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's a good word, amen. Not an easy word, but a good word. A challenge to all of us, I can guarantee you. Um, as the ushers prepare to... It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion.